Australia, 28,381. That's 31 newly confirmed cases in the last 24 hours. Uh, most of those are in New South Wales, so 25 cases there. Seven of those are overseas acquired in hotel quarantine. Um, but the uh, other elements are the uh, 18 new cases that have been uh, uh, confirmed today uh, up to 8pm last night. Uh, nine of those are <clears throat> in the Avalon cluster and, and are in that uh, area of the northern beaches and the northern part of the northern beaches. Um, most of those are, were in isolation and so uh, those are, are not of a major concern um, at the moment. They're all, all reasonably well uh, and are in that uh, area which is essentially uh, locked down. Um, the nine cases outside of the northern beaches of course are a concern and particularly uh, that cluster which has now been labelled the Croydon cluster in the inner west of Sydney. Um, uh, and uh, that's uh, all of those cases are, are close contacts of, of, of the case that was mentioned yesterday in New South Wales um, uh, and, and then uh, a couple of cases in Wollongong as well as one other in northern Sydney. Um, the, the other states, not, not a lot going on, all of those overseas acquired uh, cases. <clears throat> we have uh, um, at, pleasingly still very few cases in hospital, uh, so despite that increase um, in cases in New South Wales, we only have 19 people hospitalised uh, across the nation in relation to COVID and no, no one in ICU. This is a very different situation to many other countries. As we've said uh, a lot, there are uh, the, the intensive care units in California, for example, are completely full of and, and very much overwhelmed by the COVID situation. Um, in, in the UK, in the last 24 hours, 51,000 new cases. Uh, and many people uh, who have unfortunately passed away and many in hospitals. So we have a, still have a very um, much different situation here in Australia, but those extra cases, particularly those ones that are outside of the Northern Beaches area, which we've been following for the last week or so, are a concern. Um, just a, a couple of other matters that have come up. There's been some discussion around vaccines uh, and where we're up to in terms of vaccination uh, plans here in Australia. They, they are on target. Uh, we are going ahead with those, uh, all of those uh, uh, prepar preparatory phases, which includes um, uh, the uh, procurement of, of vaccines, making sure that, that those deliveries are coming when they um, uh, need to be here, that our regulators are, are continuing to work through this period uh, and are eagerly, eagerly awaiting further information from uh, both AstraZeneca and Pfizer in the coming days. Uh, there are no approvals yet, no full approvals yet anywhere in the world for any COVID vaccine. Uh, the emergency use authorization or similar mechanisms that are, are happening in some parts of the world are exactly that. They're for an emergency use. Uh, they are very limited. Um, and we are now um, a few weeks into that situation in the UK, uh, the US and other places. Uh, and we'll be watching and are watching very closely what is happening in relation to firstly the plans uh, of the rollout and how that's working, what we can learn from those things, uh, but particularly any safety concerns that may emerge uh, with this increased uh, numbers of vaccines that are being given uh, in other parts of the world. We'll do our full assessment. Our, our Therapeutic Goods Administration is uh, is onto that. They're, they're, um, in close uh, contact with other regulatory uh, mechanisms throughout the world, uh, virtually on a daily basis. Uh, and they'll be fast, but they'll be thorough. Uh, and, and we need to keep that confidence and people should have confidence in that regulatory approach here in, in Australia, particularly around safety, but also quality of these brand new vaccines. Um, <clears throat> the third point I just wanted to make was in relation to pre-flight testing that's been uh, mentioned uh, in recent days and there's been some interest in particularly in relation to the variant strains that are coming out of the UK and, uh, and, and South Africa, whether we should be changing our mechanisms there. Um, we're meeting the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, the AHPPC is meeting under my chairmanship every day. Uh, we met again today, we, we discussed uh, pre-flight testing yesterday in particular and again today. Uh, there's no change uh, from our medical advice in relation to what should happen there, um, uh, but we, we are looking at those, those issues carefully uh, going forward. I would say that of all the Qantas uh, some time ago um, uh, had, had already introduced their own 
uh, testing regime uh, in relation to pre-flight testing. And so Qantas are the ones that are uh, mostly associated with our, our assisted flights from uh, assisted by the Commonwealth uh, to bring uh, Australians home, particularly from the UK uh, and from India at this, at this time. Um, and uh, so Qantas is testing everyone before they, they get on the flight. Uh, anyone that's positive is not allowed to fly. And so, for example, in the most recent uh, flight that came into Howard Springs, there were 12 people who were either positive or an indeterminate result uh, from pre-flight testing and they, they were refused boarding. So, uh, th so that's actually happening with Qantas. We understand that Singapore Airlines is also doing that. Uh, and we'll be, uh, Minister Hunt has uh, requested that I write to uh, the other airlines that are coming into Australia to, to make sure that we know what they are doing in relation to pre-flight testing. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll go to, to questions. I think we've got Tamsin from the Herald Sun. Uh, they're doing three tests rather than two tests for people in that hotel quarantine system. Is that something that we would potentially consider here just to make sure that we're catching every case? And are there any other measures that we could be taking, potentially, you know, testing staff in the hotel facilities or anything like that? Or is there any other, any other measures that we could be looking at? So we, we are already, uh, all states are testing um, the, their quarantine workers uh, and others around the borders uh, at the moment on a weekly basis at least. We've, we've uh, AHPPC has issued uh, a guidance on, on that uh, regular testing as being an important component for, for staff. Uh, similarly with air crew uh, in, in recent, uh, in the last week or so that was, uh, that was uh, introduced as advice. Um, in terms of uh, how often uh, tests should be done on people in quarantine, uh, that's certainly something we'll look at in relation to, to what New Zealand has done. We, we, we learn from each other a, a lot across the Tasman, uh, so I'll follow that up. But at the moment, there's no uh, plan to change. <clears throat> Our quarantine system is very safe. We've, we've had uh, a, a formal, review, so, uh, formal review of all states except Victoria and, and by uh, Professor Holton. Um, and also then the Coates Inquiry in Victoria uh, uh, examine that in some detail. So our quarantine system is safe uh, and the, the current uh, system is working well. Um, in terms of, the, of, this, of this variant, there are many variants uh, in relation to this particular virus. It's quite stable, but that variation is helpful. It's how we do our genomic testing that people have heard about. Uh, and helps uh, helps our our disease detectives to chase down those chains of transmission and where they've come from and which ones are linked. So the variations can be very useful from a diagnostic point of view. The particular uh, variant out of the UK, we're getting more information about that. Public Health England um, uh, provided some further interim results of their of their uh, examination of that issue uh, in in the UK over the last uh, uh, overnight. Um, uh, it confirms uh, what, we, what we've said here before is that uh, this variant is not more severe, doesn't cause more severe illness. There's no increase in hospitalisation or increase in 28-day mortality. Uh, so they are, they are positive signs. It does appear that it is more transmissible, but not majorly so. Uh, and I would maintain that our two weeks of quarantine uh, with someone in their own room in a hotel, uh, as long as that's strictly adhered to, uh, means that it doesn't really matter whether that's more transmissible or not, as long as those cases, as has indeed been the case up to now, are only occurring in hotel quarantine. Um, so, uh, Jono from Nine News. Professor Kelly, thanks again for your time during this time of the year. Can I just ask you on a couple of issues? Um, rapid antigen tests, we've seen some debate around those. Uh, is there any consideration for rolling them out the border as an extra level of security measure? Do you still have concerns about their effectiveness in terms of accuracy? Uh, and when it comes to getting the vaccine, Who's going to have information about whether or not people have been vaccinated? Um, so, firstly, on the antigen tests, there there have been some antigen tests that have been uh, registered with the with the TGA, but in very limited use. Uh, they they some of them are very good, uh, some are better than others uh, in terms of uh, of diagnosis uh, of of COVID. Um, 
they they are mainly licensed for for use in in symptomatic testing, uh, not asymptomatic testing or screening at this point. Um, but we've had uh, uh, and continue to have conversations with our technical expert panels that, that assist the AHPPC in relation to antigen testing and how it would fit into uh, our testing regime. Uh, what I would say, though, we've, we've seen that, that massive increase in PCR testing uh, just before Christmas, up to almost 70,000 tests in a day, most of those in New South Wales. Um, and, and despite that, and th just remember, that's our gold standard test, the PCR test uh, in a laboratory. Um, despite that major increase in numbers, the turnaround time for, for results remained very solid, so within a day, um, even and in many cases within hours. Um, so, so we're relying on that gold standard for now. The, the antigen tests will have will have a role, definitely, but at the moment it's the PCR testing. And in terms of vaccination, um, so uh, there there are a, a lot of there is a lot of planning going on as to how the vaccine will be rolled out, how how it will be monitored, how we decide uh, how we know whether people have, been, have had their first dose, making sure they have their second dose. Uh, and making sure that that's registered so that people have a, a record of, of their vaccination and all of those things are very important and those plans uh, are going ahead in consultation with the states and territories. Um, Nick from the City Morning Herald. Thanks Professor. Um, two questions just firstly, is, is there a realistic prospect of having a kind of vaccine passport that would allow vaccinated travellers to skip hotel quarantine? at some point perhaps in, in the next year. And, and secondly, in jurisdictions where there's increasing virus case counts, is, is it sensible in those areas to hold mass crowd events? So the first, firstly, on the on the vaccine passport or immunity passport idea, that's, that's certainly a uh, something we're looking at very very carefully and closely uh, for the time being, and we uh, we have re we will be shortly reiterating that on our Smart Traveller website. I've been discussing with my colleagues in in Department of Foreign Affairs about the wording of that this morning. Uh, we were asked to do that by by uh, the Foreign Minister. Um, uh, is, is that there's no change. If people have been vaccinated or not, they will be having 14 days quarantine for the time being. Um, and, and we should remember that although uh, vaccine has been rolled out in a number of countries, I think um, tomorrow will be, will be uh, the first person in the UK will be getting their second dose of vaccine. And we know that the Pfizer vaccine, even though it's very effective, that uh, maximum effectiveness doesn't kick in until a week after the second vaccine, which is uh, essentially a month after the first vaccine. Um, so, so we have some time to consider the, the, these matters, um, but for the moment, uh, vaccination will not um, be a, an alternative to 14-day quarantine, and those decisions will have to be thought through carefully over the coming months as to, as to how that will be handled. And the second one about mass crowd events, I presume you're referring to the Sydney Cricket Test Match? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll admit I'm a cricket tragic. I, I've, I've, I've been to many Sydney test matches. Uh, um, the most memorable one, um, I'll give a shout out to my 91 year old mother-in-law and my 86 year old father. Um, uh, we had a, a wonderful day at the cricket and I know it's a great thing for, for Sydney to, to have that event. Um, uh, we've, we know that outdoor um, entertainment or that is in a seated venue is much safer than, uh, than indoor gatherings and that was uh, stressed by the New South Wales Health uh, today and I agree with, with that. Um, I must, uh, must say that I, I'm, I, and I'm, I, I know that there are very uh, good COVID safe plans that have been reinforced with uh, New South Wales Health, the, the, uh, the SCG I'm sure as well as Cricket Australia uh, and, and that will be able to be looked at in coming days. Um, there's crowd restrictions for example, um, uh, masks will be available etc. Um, but I, I, I would just reiterate with my family, I wouldn't be taking them to, to this particular cricket because of their vulnerability. Um, and so there, there is a risk. Uh, it needs to be outweighed with the benefits, of course. The other thing I would say is that, that uh, the start date's the 7th of, of January and nine days is very long in COVID time. So let's see what happens in Sydney in, in the next week. Um, any follow-up questions? Tamsin first. Um, I was just wondering if, how, how confident you were that the, I guess, the way that other states have dealt with 
the Sydney outbreak that managed to stop um, the virus getting in. Do you have any concerns that we haven't detected the virus um, in other cities that's come from the Sydney cluster? Well, I'd, I'd reiterate the, the the advice we've been giving from the beginning. If people have even the mildest symptoms that might be related to, to COVID and everyone knows what they are now, uh, to please get tested, come forward and be tested. Uh, the testing rates in other, other states out, and territories outside of New South Wales are pretty low at the moment. Uh, but please um, just consider uh, getting tested if you have those those symptoms um, and, and watch out for that advice if you have traveled from Sydney uh, from the greater Sydney area um, there are a large number of venues now of interest uh, not only in the northern beaches but elsewhere uh, and so if you if you have been to any of those places please um, uh, take that advice from New South Wales Health. Uh, at the moment, in terms of, uh, 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 other than that, I think uh, um, the states and territories have made their assessments in relation to risk and they, they are re-examining that um, actively every, every day uh, when AHPPC is meeting. Anyone else with a follow-up, Jono? Oh, Chief, I'm Chief, but in all if I could, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're obviously about 24 hours slightly more away from setting out this year. What's your hope, your vision for 2021? Um, well, uh, let's hope for a better year than 2020. I think it's been a very long year for everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is great hope with the vaccines. Uh, that's, that's certainly something that um, we should pin our hope on early in the new year. Uh, that, will, uh, that will change the way we, we're able to deal with this, um, with this virus uh, into the next year. And apologies for the people in the room. I, I was just <laughs> looking at the, at the phone. So um, the, thanks. Can I just confirm? Mm. You, given the current restrictions in Sydney, you still think it's OK for the SCG to host cricket? Uh, so that's a decision ultimately for the New South Wales authorities. Uh, as I said, I'm happy to see the cricket going ahead. Where that should happen um, is a matter for, for the authorities as well as with, uh, with Cricket Australia and so forth. If they have the COVID safe plans in place at this stage, yes, I'm happy with that. But uh, as I said, nine days is a long time in COVID time. And let's see what happens, particularly with that Croydon cluster. Professor, are you aware of a shop in Brisbane that has put up a sign saying people wearing a surgical mask aren't allowed to enter the store, saying your body makes particles when you're healing, they're not contagious. If you are fragile and believe you need to wear a mask, do not enter. What do you, what do you think of that? Uh, well, I don't agree with it. Um, I think, it, it, as I've made clear on many occasions, in terms of in terms of mask use, that's a, that's a matter for people's choice. Uh, particularly if you're a vulnerable vulnerable to more severe COVID infection, you should be considering that. Uh, particularly in places of community transmission. Now, there's no community trans transmission that we know of in in uh, Brisbane at the moment, but uh, but certainly I'd be interested in the details of that shop. Do you think it's Uh, well, it's firstly not true, and secondly, uh, yes, I, I would prefer that they wouldn't be putting up signs like that. How, um, sorry, how concerned are you about the Sydney clusters? I mean, the, the Croydon cluster has no known links to the Northern Beaches. Is there widespread, undetected community transmission in Sydney? And do you think that it would be wise to perhaps go through a Melbourne-style lockdown now to prevent that later? So New South Wales health right throughout this pandemic have been the, the, our, our, our poster, poster people, if you like, um, in relation to their contact tracing. They, they are superb at this and it always uh, amazes me how quickly they get onto things and how quickly they work through what are sometimes very complex chains of transmission. Um, and, and get very detailed genomic analysis very quickly. So uh, they're onto this, they're onto it uh, immediately. That first case came forward and well done for them coming forward and getting a test. Uh, and now, now we need to wait and see. Um, they, they have introduced new, uh, new issues today in terms of uh, household gatherings, and I think that's appropriate. Um, new Year's Eve celebrations are a concern, uh, and I know that they're, 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 they've looked at that very carefully and they've decided on the, on, on the course they've taken today. But I, I know uh, the Chief Health Officer in, in uh, New South Wales will be looking at this very carefully in coming days uh, and make that proportionate, proportionate decision weighing up risks and benefits, which of course they need to do. Professor, are you concerned about 
misinformation on COVID-19 spreading on social media? Are you worried that could lead to breaches of protocols, hotel quarantine, or affect the uptake rate of a vaccine? And then would you uh, like if the social media platforms provided you with the information of the most viral content so that you can see what information people are absorbing? Do you think that's a good idea? Well, certainly, uh, you know, my call, not so much to the people that are putting those things up, but, but particularly to those who might be reading them, there is there is a, a, a very good source of truth. It's uh, it's through the experts that you you can trust through uh, the Australian government and state and territory governments. Uh, and I would suggest you listen to them rather than uh, other things on social media. Uh, in terms of our monitoring of social media, we do monitor social media very carefully and uh, when there are reasons for us to, uh, to counter some of the um, uh, less scientifically based arguments, uh, we do so. Would you like then more transparency from the social media platforms themselves to just you know, maybe you have a live list of all the things that are most viral, the, the most information most people are consuming, so you can keep an eye on it, make it easier for you and your team? Well, we, we have ways of looking at that as well, and, and, and I know that um, uh, that several of the social media platforms have been very fast on, on removing misinformation in the, par in, in the past, and I encourage them to keep doing that. Last question? Oh. Yeah. Can I have two? Yeah, have two, okay. yes. Um, so back in March or April, Brendan Murphy said that there were likely 10 times more cases in Australia and across the globe than were um, detected or that were recorded. Do you think that is still the case in Sydney right now? First question, and then I'll... Yeah. So, uh, so early on, when we were when we uh, started back at that time, when when uh, Professor Murphy made that, that comment, we, we were restricting the who was being tested, and so I, I'm sure in those early days there were some uh, that that uh, had had the disease and, and and were not picked up by the PCR testing, um, and and that's been confirmed by the serological uh, studies that have been done in Sydney, and and that one in ten is about right. Um, but uh, I I think things have changed rapidly. Um, and enormously since then. So uh, particularly when we look at the numbers of tests that were done just before Christmas, um, I'd be very surprised if there were people, many people wandering around Sydney right now with, an, uh, with, with a lack of diagnosis. Um, but just to, just to re-emphasise, if anyone does have even the mildest of symptoms anywhere in Sydney, Greater Sydney, including Wollongong and the Central Coast right now, please, please come forward uh, and get your free test because that's the way we can tell, uh, we can answer that question. And just on the vaccine, um, why is the TGA de delaying emergency approval? What's the difference between an emergency approval and the final approval? Is it an approval, an approval? And if it does, if the timeline is still correct and we get an approval in January, why then will it take until March for the rollout? Isn't that just too long? So, so firstly, the TGA is not delaying anything. Uh, there, there is no mechanism in Australia which is similar to the emergency approvals that have been put, uh, put forward by other regulators. Um, just to be very clear, emergency approval is very different from a, re a, a regular standard full approval. Um, all of those emergency approvals that have happened overseas uh, come with, with very strict guidelines about who, who can be given it, what sort of um, uh, uh, wraparound in terms of safety and so forth and, and monitoring uh, will happen. So it's a, it's a very different process. We don't have that process in Australia. We don't have an emergency here in Australia. Uh, in terms of, of, of when uh, that, that approval will come forward, once we have all the information that we, we need to make that approval from, from the, the, the companies that are, are making these uh, uh, vaccines available, um, that will be very quickly but thoroughly looked at. And these are many, many pages of tens of thousands of pages of documents. Uh, so we have our, our team on standby right now. As soon as that arrives, we'll be looking at it. Um, and, and that will be an independent uh, regulator's uh, approval process, as, as is the case with every vaccine and every new uh, medicine in Australia. Um, as soon as that's done, that's not quite the end of the story. There needs to be some batch testing and so forth for quality, uh, the, and, and then the final distribution will happen very rapidly after that. So the, the rate limiting step really is getting the information from the companies themselves, the full information, so that can be absolutely and fully um, looked at and, and the regulatory decision can be made. Yep. Okay, thanks very much.